wanted to give you guys a little bit more information about this wood furnish that we had installed recently uh, and how it's working out for us, along with some of the pros and cons of working with the wood furnace. So here it is again. We got this one from Menards. It's available from Home Depot and Tractor Supply, same unit. If you kind of generally just do a Google with 3,500 square foot wood furnace, this is the one that pops up kind of at all different sites. One thing I would mention uh, is that it's much more expensive from some places than others. The last time I looked at Home Depot, it was about 3,500 square, $3,500. Uh, Menards, $2,000 and tractor supply was something like $2,500. So it really matters where you get it from. Menards obviously has that 11% uh, rebate that can really help out as well. It's just in terms of the cost of getting it. But starting out, you know, backing up a little bit, you've got to worry about your, uh, your installation. So here you see the ductwork going out. We had to put a new liner in. I'll try to get a flashlight and show this a little bit better. There was an existing port right there, but it's not lined all the way up. So this house, I think I've mentioned in some other videos, uh, if it looks familiar at least, this home is about 120 years old. It has a double chimney uh, that's here. So left side, right side, two different ports originally for um, you know, for, for the, the furnace, the original furnace, and then for uh, the furnace in the cooking or the cooking spot originally. But both of them had been abandoned at the point that we purchased the house and we had these condensing natural gas furnaces. So because they're condensing, they've got that PVC pipe and the PVC pipe, uh, that lower temperature output gas is going and exhausted out the side of the house here. So we're not, we weren't putting anything up through the existing chimney. All that said, we had these masonry chimney uh, spaces that weren't lined. And we really can't use that to exhaust the gas for any of the kind of modern systems. They needed to have a liner put in. So we've got some of this uh, connected, like little portions, and I'll show you. I've got a couple of these out here. If you go to Menards, you can get uh, two foot long portions here. You can order longer sections, but the ones they have in stock are two feet. And honestly, that works out pretty well. They kind of come in this wrapped up version and you'll pull them out individually and snap them together and you can get corners and you know, anything else you need to, to make the length that you need. The two feet sections actually work pretty well. They're a lot easier to handle. You can get longer ones, like I said, four foot or I think maybe even longer than that if you order them online. But this way you can take back anything you don't use and you can you know kind of adjust your job if you're working on it in the day and end up needing some more. So what we did is we used this existing hole, um, went in through here, you can kind of go around to the back and we actually cut a hole in the back because uh, this is the, the main route we're using. We put a clean out right here. So there's a T and you can see that we could pull off the back of this and you'd actually be able to see down into the hole is to the other side. But on the other side of this, we've got the liner going up the chimney shaft. In order to, uh, to get something down it, we actually didn't use these two feet sections the whole way you can purchase a stainless steel uh, chimney liner. I think the one that we purchased was 35 feet and it's about $500. And that's what we used for most of the distance. This is a three-story house. We ended up needing a little bit more than 35 feet. So we've connected to it with those uh, two feet sections. The nice thing about the continuous liner, there's no worry about uh, any holes, any gaps in the connections, which wasn't really a huge concern but our old chimney space uh, was really you know, had mortar and things that were kind of making it difficult to traverse down it. And that one is semi-flexible. It was a little bit easier. We still had to try to put it down from above and we tied onto it and kind of pulled it from that hole that I was showing over here. Kind of just explained the way. If you've got a similar project, these are the kind of, kind of issues you'll end up dealing with. So you can see where we've mortared all that back together. Uh, but we tied a rope, kind of lowered it in from the top, tied off around the uh, around the base of it, and pulled it down so that that liner comes down to about here, or I guess down to here, and actually makes the connection with this T. And then on the top of it, we added these two foot sections as we went. And there's a specific way you need to put the crimp side down. Uh, you'll, it's kind of counterintuitive. You'd think as the gas is flowing up through this that it would be better. Uh, to have the gas going this way and kind of like the inner 
inner crimped area on the bottom edge that might help with the flow so you didn't have any gas coming out, but that's not the way that it's stated in the instructions. In any case, just wanted to point it out, getting that liner in there was a fairly big effort, especially because you've got to work at 35 feet in the, up on top of the roof to get it in there. But once that was all in, we've got our lined path all the way down, and then we had the, the furnace to get in place. The next, I guess, part of that is that the furnace is very, very heavy. Uh, you can move it around with you know a couple people, but one of the things that made it easier was to take out the fire bricks that are inside. And that's a pretty, pretty easy, a little bit of a pain in the butt, but it's a pretty easy process and it made it a lot easier to move. You can see that this is fairly narrow, so it doesn't really have any trouble getting it or you won't have any trouble getting it through doorways, um, but it's a lot easier to manage. I think it's, it's almost scary heavy with the bricks in it. Uh, we got it down the stairs without the bricks in it and I was on the lower side of it and that was uh, worrisome enough as it was. I wouldn't want to have any more weight in it. So I would recommend that if you're moving it around, especially if you're going to put it in a basement or something. After that, uh, kind of just point out a few different pieces. It doesn't come like this. You've got to assemble it. We've got the box here. This is basically the air intake for the distribution air. And it's maybe important to point out, this is obvious to anybody that works in this area, but maybe not to novices that are kind of coming in. The air systems are entirely separate. So there's the air that's going into the combustion area, uh, you know, your, your draft air that is going to be forced in through here. They've got the blower motor, and that's going to increase oxygen to, to your, uh, your combustion area here. So I'm gonna open this up. You can see inside. You can adjust the draft, like a manual draft adjustment here, and then that blower will also add more oxygen. So there's kind of two pieces of control to it. All of this will have to be, this is installed, and then you wire it in. I ended up getting help with this portion uh, from a, a local guy that does a lot of the kind of HVAC work around here. He did the wiring, we did everything else with the process, but that part I was happy to have some assistance with. Uh, so you've gotta, you gotta put the box together. I bought a reusable air filter. Those are kind of an interesting thing on their own, just so you don't, you, know, you can change it regularly, you can clean it, and you don't have to worry about uh, maybe stretching too far in between, uh, trying to save a dollar or something like that. I'd like to try to try these out for now, these reusable air filters. So I'll just show you, it pulls through here. Um, and then you've got blower fans for that distribution air system that sit right there. And they, so they're in the box, there's two of them, and they blow air around this inner box. And so this outer edge is where the air is actually coming out that would be going up into the ductwork. We don't have the ductwork here, so it's just blowing up right here. Uh, when I initially was kind of envisioning this, I thought it would be very, very hot. It's not, it's not like dangerously hot. You could, you could touch that. Uh, you can certainly touch the air here. It's not that warm. Uh, like you're not gonna be worried about creating a fire or something out of that. The sensor here, turns on those fans, those larger fans, lower fans down here. So there's kind of two sensing areas. If you're not able to hit your set point, I've got my temperature up here or my uh, thermostat. If you can't hit the set point, then you're gonna be turning on or the blower will turn on and it will provide more air to your fire. And when this sensor heats up sufficiently, it turns on the blower fan to blow the heat off of this box and into your space. And so those are kind of the two controls, two different fan systems that are controlling it. Again, the draft blower is gonna be controlling going through this air system and then that air is gonna go out your exhaust and then the other air is completely distinct that's coming in from the back and then going up through here. So you're not gonna be smelling you know, smoke and wood. And again, for a lot of folks, I think that that's probably common knowledge, but it's not for everybody. Uh, generally, we don't have a lot of like wood burning smell. If you do open up the the face of it to add more wood, my recommendation would be open it up as briefly as you can. Get your wood in there. You're going to get a little smoke coming out. They do have a little face shield that comes along with it. Mine's laying there on the ground. It doesn't move very well, and I don't find it to be a very big issue. It also uh, 
makes it harder to get the wood wood in there and to uh, rake around the ash. So next piece in the mornings, I often, as the, the fire has died down, you'll rake it around and you've got your ash pan down here at the bottom. You can see a little bit there. You're gonna want something to dump that into, something that's uh, like a metal bucket or something. Uh, we've got kind of a ceramic bowl for now and I've got a metal bucket on the way. Just kind of your maintenance things to work on. One of the biggest things to keep in mind with the system is that you're gonna need an enormous amount of wood that's very dirty and time consuming. Uh, so you can see we're taking it in through a basement window. We've got an unfinished basement space. And so this is really ideal for us. Uh, you won't be able to see from here, but along that side of our house, there was a, a driveway that's no longer in use. So we can pull up from the street with a load of wood and drop it in through an old window. And then we've got it kind of close by here I'm stacking up, probably moving things around a little bit more, but we've got our stack here close by. So we're within a few steps. I think in the future, uh, we'll be just taking it right in through this window, putting it right on the stack. And we'll have a better feel after this winter as to how much we really need to get through the whole winter. So I mentioned this a little bit in the short video, uh, but I can kind of speak to some of the temperature and the wood needs and the uh, uh, economics and some of those pieces as well. So the big thing for us in terms of getting enough wood, you could do that throughout the year. We actually purchased this right at the edge of you know, starting up the winter and we didn't have a lot of wood and you want to have you know, seasoned wood so you're not having issues, uh, both with kind of the efficiency and building up pre-sole in your, in your liner. So for us, we have a landscape recycling center where contractors and landscaping folks can drop off their materials. They have an unlimited amount of drop off for, for wood. I think there's a fee to the contractor and then that landscape recycling center just allows anyone to go and get wood from that site. A lot of it's bulk pickup and you'll have to either chop it up further or, uh, or you can split it on site or do whatever, but all of it's free. So some of this we've had to split from there, but a lot of the wood there's, there's an unlimited amount, at least from our perspective. I don't think they've ever run, run out. Uh, and I should send a picture at some point or, or I'll post it. Of There's just like a couple acres of wood that's 20 feet tall. Uh, just stacks that are 20 feet tall, a couple acres of it. And you can pick it up and it's all free. So your source is free. The labor of handling it uh, is fairly, is much more cost, you know, it's much more expensive actually splitting it, cutting it up, that kind of thing. That's going to take some time, but I guess, you know, it kind of depends what you want to do. And I think there's a great feeling for being able to heat your home this way. Splitting wood is somewhat enjoyable. I guess it depends on the scale. And if you're able to do it over the course of a year or two, I kind of build up that stock. I find it very rewarding. If you've got a huge home like this, you probably have quite a few people that could help out as well. If you have a smaller home, it's not going to be nearly as much effort. Anyway, so it would be nice uh, to use a model this size with a smaller home. When I was mentioning the controls, if you're able to hit your set point and that, that draft fan, a blower fan will shut off and then you've got the wood in there but you're not speeding up the combustion and so you, it's gonna last longer. You know, as it is, we're putting more oxygen on it, we're getting more heat out of it but it's gonna burn up that wood faster. And that's great to provide the maximum heat output, but it's also going to mean we got to refill it more often. So the biggest benefit on my side would be a larger firebox. That's kind of why I went with the largest model that I could find at one of the big box stores. I'm sure there's, uh, there's larger indoor models somewhere, but that was really critical. I'd say a big part of that as well is how much processing do I need to do to the wood? The less I need to process it, the you know, fewer times I need to split it, the more I can just pick stuff up and put it right in, pick it up from landscape recycling, pick it up from, you know, let's say a, a medium-sized log or something like that and get it right in there. That's going to minimize my workload and make it that much more cost-effective. Uh, so that would be more beneficial. As it is, we're able to put pretty good-sized stuff in here. Everything that you see in this pile will fit. Uh, I think that... I'd have to look up the specs on this, but it says something like 22 inches. It's really a very large firebox. 
uh, comparatively. Like I said, I think it was the biggest thing I could find that was on the market. So I guess the next step would be uh, the heat output. You can see the rating online, but more practically, again, three stories, uh, about 3,200 square feet for our house. And at this point, when we get down to temperatures, I think around 25, uh, that's when what we've seen so far, that's about uh, where we can keep a pretty good heat distribution in the home. And then uh, below that, I think we're going to start needing to supplement. Another part of that is how much variability you're willing to accept in your, in your house. So if you'll, you know, our first floor is very warm. The basement, I think we've got temperatures down here that uh, were maybe 80, maybe higher. Right now I've got the thermostat sitting very close to the exhaust. So uh, it's, it's misleading, but in the basement, I think we're regularly going to be 75-ish. On the first floor at that thermostat, I'm seeing temperatures between 70 and 73. Very comfortable, maybe a little warmer than we need it to be. On the second floor, we're more like 65. And then on the third floor, we're actually very similar. Uh, by that point, I think it's just, you know, it's capped off with that in that space. We don't have a lot more air mo movement. Um, so we're, we're hitting numbers kind of around that area. If you're willing to put your set points down a little bit lower, if your set point can be down to 60, uh, then, you know, when this heat is more variable, right? You've got to keep loading it. So at night, if you load it up, you're going to get good heat for several hours if that fan stays on. And then after that, it's going to start, you know, using up the fuel. If it was a smaller space, you'd hit your set point and then you wouldn't be burning through your fuel as quickly. It probably wouldn't hurt for us to have two of these. Uh, and you can kind of keep them going and you'd really be able to blast it and maybe have one of them attached to the second floor ductwork system. That may be something we do with this one in the future. Here's our second floor ductwork. We could uh, put a damper and partially blow out the air down here and let that rise up to the first floor and partially go through to the second floor. That's a potential that we could try out kind of in the future. Right now, it's still pretty exciting just as, as well as it's doing. Uh, you know, we're enjoying it. And, and it's going pretty well. So I think these are a lot of the points I wanted to hit. In terms of a payback, I'd say it's going to be, uh, I, it, you know, there's, there's some different aspects. The biggest part is whether or not you're going to include your labor and time, however you're getting a hold of this wood. If I was going to purchase the wood, delivered, split, you know, the highest end, kind of seasoned for a couple of years, delivered and split, I don't know that we would have any savings. Uh, you would have the redundancy that you could use it this way, even if there was a disruption in natural gas, which is very rare, and then you'd still have the ability, but there wouldn't really likely be much of a cost savings, if anything. And that's going to be very dependent on the region and everything else as well. If, it's, if we're just getting free wood and we don't mind splitting it, moving it around, then I think our payback will be something on the order of three to four years, depending on, uh, I guess, depending on how much it uh, we can use the wood furnace during the coldest time of the year. We'll be able to use it, but how much more do we need to use the natural gas? Uh, so that's kind of economically, that's good. It's not, it's not amazing, maybe, I guess, because you do have all that additional labor. A huge part of this is going to be how easy is it for you to get wood and deal with kind of the mess and logistics that goes along with that. If you work from home, uh, I, I work from home almost every day. So putting wood in the morning, putting wood out throughout the day, very easy for me to do. If you had a smaller house, again, that'd be easier as well. Uh, kind of a lot of pieces there. Having that driveway next door so you can drop it down makes it a lot easier. Um, but the logistics of handling that much wood is really, I think, a big part of what it all kind of comes down to. So that's most of what I wanted to hit. Probably some overkill on it. I'm sure there's additional questions. Just a few things kind of thinking of. We had a, a gap in here, so we've got some heat resistant uh, or high temperature insulation that we purchased. Stuff that in so we don't have any more kind of chimney effect. We don't want anything that's going to be sucking uh, air up through that chimney space, the rest of the open chimney space. Uh, just, I guess, some of those few little things I'm sure will come up uh, that I've forgotten to mention here. But that's a lot of what I wanted to talk about. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, feel free to leave a comment and question, uh, and we'll talk to everyone soon.
Thanks for watching this far, and we'll see you guys later.